Thank you so much. It's delightful to be here at a YIM meeting. Uh, I remember the first YIM, uh, which was just a revelation. The way Ron managed to get everybody into this incredible enthusiasm and the fallout that it's had has been tremendous, uh, as Vijay spoke about yesterday. So I want to thank Ron and I want to thank all of the successive YI uh, organizers for doing such a great job. So today I'm going to tell you about my love affair with cells and uh, this particular stem cell, this little sleeping stem cell, the muscle, adult muscle stem cell, which sleeps on a, a myofiber bed uh, covered by two sheets uh, and is essentially quiet most of adult life until required to repair muscle. And I'm going to tell you about the path that I took to come to my studies on this. I will also reprise several themes that were addressed yesterday. Um, one is the issue of collaboration. The other is the issue of how uh, important it is to integrate into your environment and with your enthusiasm convert it into something that you would like to see there as opposed to expecting it to be preformed. And at the end, I'm going to reprise a theme which Shashi brought up about the history of science in India. And I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. One, an old story uh, from the era just post-independence, and one, a new story, both of which give me tremendous amount of inspiration. And I hope they'll inspire you too. So I started off wanting to go to art school, but was rejected by every school I applied to and I was rescued by a Jesuit botanist who was my teacher in my bachelor's uh, program. Uh, Father Cecil Saldana, a Jesuit, an evolutionary biologist, a taxonomist, uh, not necessarily always thought of in the same time frame or thought process, but a marvelous mentor, enthusiastic, absolutely exacting, made everybody in his class totally excited about the flora of the Western Ghats, this wonderful mountain range, ecologically so sensitive and so important to the biology of our country. Uh, Cecil at the time was working on a flora of the Western Ghats as well as of Karnataka. And he said, why don't you come on field trips with me and make observations which we can put together to help document some of the things that we are finding. And I thought this sounded marvelous. So, one of the wonderful things about the Western Ghats is this ephemeral kind of vegetation that happens just during the monsoons. At times when there are rock faces which are laterite, they are completely bare. But one monsoon and you have this incredible, beautiful uh, flowering species, delicate and absolutely critical to the biology of that system. This obviously was something that would catch anybody's attention and imagination. So it was a wonderful year that I spent with him. And I then decided that maybe science was for me. But I took three attempts to find the right PhD program. OK, so the first one was at IISC, where I joined a PhD program to study tRNA modifications in uh, millet. And it just didn't excite me. So I went looking for adventure and went to Canada where there was a guy who was cloning chloroplast genes, but it didn't grab me either. By the time I ended up in Boston, so two and a half, three years later, where other people were telling me, what's wrong with you? You're wasting all this time. I figured it was important to get something that I really loved doing. And that was when I encountered Steve Farmer at the Boston University School of Medicine and entered the absolutely glorious world of cell biology. And what I studied for my PhD uh, back in 1985 was adhesion-dependent gene regulation in cultured fibroblasts. And it was, you know, uh, the, our key findings were that actually adhesive proteins like collagen and fibronectin were actually key targets of the gene regulatory program when you change or alter cell adhesion. Now, that doesn't sound like a, you know, earth-shattering result, and it's not. But I will say that with the sort of solid uh, uh, papers that I got out of that, 
I also got a thought process which stood me in good stead because many years later when it came for me to start my own lab, I realized that one of the ways to induce quiescence in otherwise proliferating cells and keep them quiescent without differentiating was to actually block actomyosin contractility and to block cell adhesion. And that is a model that we've used for many years. So uh, that whole field has morphed into a wonderful field of genome topology and how it's regulated by mechanosignaling and how chromatin can be organized based on extracellular cues and you know that field has gone in a very different direction. But my path next took me to Stanford where there was a tremendous amount of excitement uh, at Helen Blau's lab to try and use uh, basically cells as mediators for gene therapy rather than just making genetically modified organisms or injecting genes as viruses to actually transduce cells which are normally found in the, in the body, take them out ex vivo, transduce them with genes and put them back as a source of new protein that might be therapeutically useful. So in our proof of principle sort of studies, we were, Helen's uh, lab of course worked on muscle and uh, I got interested in not just the engineering aspects of doing this therapeutic um, um, stuff but actually got interested in the stem cells themselves, the endogenous stem cells and that's what I've continued studying. So what I'm showing here are a picture of a young Tom Rando and Grace Pavlath who are leaders in the field today and were postdocs at the same time as I was in the Helen's lab. And through these 25 years, we've had tremendous scientific engagement, collaborations, very warm friendship, and most importantly, uh, in addition to all of this, they were people who ensured that while I was floating off to my backwater of a lab uh, somewhere else on the other side of the world, that they made sure that they would invite me to meetings where the muscle stem cell community met. And this was transformational for me because it made sure that I kept current with ideas. So in 96, I moved to CCMB, taking up an independent position, and I wove the threads that I had studied previously to tackle stem cell quiescence and asked the question, how do adult stem cells attain and maintain quiescence? And how do they break it and make these little clones of cells which then go on and repair tissue? Now, when you start on something like this, there's a major problem of orientation. What is it that you're going to do? Are you going to be a one-trick pony or a jack of all trades? Are you going to study the whole of cell biology? What is it that you're going to ask? And I think the answer for me is that I've essentially been all of these because I've used the same system over and over again, but I've used multiple different uh, um, sort of levels of trying to understand where they fit in and my key interest is really the state of cellular quiescence and not any one of the particular mechanisms and I'll try and summarize for you what we learned. So here's those sleeping stem cells again and what I realized in the course of our studies was that the strength of this stillness is an anticipatory program in which greater forces prepare for action because at the time it was considered that quiescence was essentially a program where nothing happened. You don't synthesize DNA, there's very little transcription, there's very little translation, not much signaling, so what is it that these guys do? And everything was put as a, a sort of a sleeping beauty model where they had to be woken up by a signal from outside, but there was less emphasis on what was actually happening inside this cell to keep it resilient and resistant and available for future unpredictable bouts of damage. And in fact, this is what the strength of the stem cell is. You damage muscle, you end up with a huge mess. Two weeks later, it's perfect again. And you can do this over and over and over again, and it'll keep doing it. And it's because of the presence of those stem cells, which not only proliferate and divide, differentiate, and give rise to new muscle, but they also make more copies of themselves and go back into the sleeping niche. So, one of the things that we realized early on was that you can isolate these satellite stem cells from their niche, but you immediately break quiescence. So if you're interested 
in the program of quiescence in vivo, it's really not amenable to genome-wide analysis because the moment you take them out, they're no longer quiescent. And we asked the question, how can we uh, uh, sort of access the molecular attributes of this state? And this is where my old uh, sort of uh, PhD work came back where we took cells which were proliferating in culture and put them in suspension in a jelly-like uh, substance with the same growth factors that they had when they were in culture and lo and behold because they require attachment they went into quiescence they shut off the differentiation or determination program which was that they kind of almost looked like non-muscle cells except that they had a memory mechanism which allowed them to come back into the cell cycle and remember who they were. So one of the first things that we did, which was the work of uh, Chetna Sachitanandan who is here, uh, was that she isolated genes from these suspension arrested myoblasts and showed that they in fact mark the right cells in culture. And this went for us a long way in being able to say that this culture model is at least a first approximation of what's happening in vivo. Okay, so one of the key findings, and then I'll move away from science, um, is that what we found was something really remarkable. If you take proliferating cells, and you do a clonogenic assay, which is that you take a thousand cells and you plate them on a dish, you get a certain number of colonies. You've plated them very sparsely, they don't really know that their neighbors are around, so you're asking them to go it alone. So they make a few colonies. Now you take those same cells and you put them into a quiescent state in culture, and then you take them out and ask them to make colonies, and lo and behold, something happened during that quiescent state that makes them much better stem cells. So why might that be? suggests the induction of a cellular regenerative program which actually allows self-renewal at a time when the cell is not dividing, sort of a contradiction in terms. Anyway, so we've used that to study many aspects of uh, stem cell biology from chromatin to uh, signaling, etc. And so I have a friend who says, uh, this is a terrible quote from Goebbels, which says, whenever I hear the word culture, I reach for my revolver. So I was always getting ragged at muscle stem cell meetings saying, why are you using this terrible model system which is in culture? You should be studying the cells in mice. And we have done some of that, but we still stay with our culture model because it actually gives us insights which you can't get from mice. So the benefits of this modest lifestyle of the quiescent cell uh, is, one of them is, uh, spending my life in what Al Hershey called Hershey heaven, which was his idea of scientific happiness was to have one experiment that works and then just keep doing it all the time. And in some ways, that's what I've done all my life. <coughs> so the other thing is the other metaphors from life which inform biology. Okay? Many times I have wanted a master Shifu to appear and create inner peace uh, in uh, uh, in the chaos of, of what passes for scientific research. Uh, but the, the cell actually manages to achieve that and in fact creates these anticipatory programs which govern this quiescent state and they are critical for tissue repair. Okay, so I'm going to switch and talk about metaphors from biology which actually inform science organization and how institutions need to develop and to grow and very importantly to regenerate because it's often easy to start something with a great deal of enthusiasm, but sustaining something and making sure that it stays current is something which is much different as a challenge. So I'm going to talk, so about 10 years after I'd had my program at, at CCMB, I'd gotten involved quite a bit with the DBT stem cell task force because there was a fledgling stem cell program which DBT wanted to fund. and. Uh, so there were a group of us who were asked to participate in building this program and uh, about you know four or five years after that program the stem cell task force had taken off uh, Professor Ban and Vijay uh, one day sort of tapped me on the shoulder and said look here there's you know something interesting that we're doing we've been discussing with our friends Jim Spudich and Ron Vale and we think it's really important for us to have a national stem cell institute and these are the other people who were tremendously involved in setting that up. Uh, Ram, Jitu, Apurva and Upi. 
um, these three all from NCBS and Ram who was hired to come back from Iowa uh, where he was Dean of Research. So this was the plan and this is an early plan for the, the Bangalore Bio Cluster which was nucleated around NCBS. It was very clear that you couldn't start a standalone stem cell institute in the middle of nowhere expecting it to just flourish without substantial nurturing from existing centers of excellence and NCBS was a natural choice. So they asked me to help with uh, getting the documentation and the, the hiring started and it was a tremendously exciting time. It required me to move laterally from my thought process of just me and my lab to expanding a vision which had already been wonderfully articulated by these two very charismatic and visionary leaders and to take it to something which was actually going to happen on the ground. So that was what started as INSTEM and its mission was really collaborative research and education and innovation and sort of reprising from things that um, Tony talked about yesterday uh, about creating cooperative environments which really enables people to move beyond their comfort zone and tackle problems that they would never tackle on their own and create a kind of a think tank uh, situation where you could actually bring people from many different subjects together under one roof. So it took a long time to get the land in place and all of the regulatory aspects together and start faculty hiring. So rather than wait for all of that to happen, we just started having courses right away. And it was marvelous because we invited people from all over the world. We started doing experiments with stem cells in mice and fish. And these are just some pictures of a program that we started in, in, in shared space at NCBS. We had no building yet. We just started. By 2012, there were already 13 or 14 investigators from many different parts of uh, the country and the world, many of them coming back through uh, meetings such as this, YIM, Praveen Vemula, who's a nanotechnology guy who's now working on immune suppression uh, and home, uh, you know, homeostasis and inflammation. He never might have thought he was going to do that had he uh, continued on his career path as, uh, in his postdoc. Das, who works on planaria, the ultimate regenerator. Uh, Shravanti, who works on chromatin. Um, Ravi, who works on the mechanisms of the fragile X protein. So there's all different kinds of things which were happening and it was a very exciting time. And this has progressed um, now at INSTEM under the able guidance of Jitu and Apurva. Uh, you have uh, six major themes. Uh, which go from cardiovascular biology, brain development, inflammation, chemical biology, cell fate and a wonderful team of people who respond to the science by creating new technologies and new ways and new platforms for doing things. And the program that I started morphed into the program which Apurva has taken forward and her, her uh, focus is now looking at metabolism and stem cell fate, which is a, a very topical and interesting uh, idea. So the main thing is that I want to say that, you know, these centers, many of them may have a certain lifetime and then change into something else based on what it is that they actually find. So one needs flexibility and adaptation and a foc with that focus on collaborative research, taking it in the direction which the participants actually create rather than having a top down instruction as in a department structure. So this has been, I think, successful. So back to CCMB in 2013, thinking I'm going to get back into the lab staying with quiescence as always and studying different aspects of chromatin, signaling to chromatin, mechanical cues and also uh, following in, in Tony's footstep mRNA granules, mRNP granules which seem to be yet another balancing mechanism for making sure that mRNA decay and utilization by translation are actually balanced in the quiescent cell. So now I'm going to reprise a theme from Shashi. Um, the enterprise of science as you see it today in India is relatively new, right? Harvard predates the founding of the US. Stanford, Yale, MIT, the UC systems are decades to centuries old. 
Oxford and Cambridge started in the 1200s, Bologna in the 1100s, right? So what we are talking about in India in its current form is something very new. They are not going to take the path taken elsewhere. They may learn from them, but this is a completely different context. So what I want to tell you is that, you know, you might actually contribute in ways that you cannot imagine now, even in ways that you actually have no intention of doing now, okay? So I'm going to tell you about a story of four friends in post-independence era, about 1951 to 1971, uh, reminding our uh, non-Indian uh, friends that India gained independence in 47. So their names were Goku, Sivaraj, Satish and Rad, okay? This was a group of men and this, I'm, I'm telling you this story because it emphasizes the importance of friendship and collaboration. The collaboration may not have been specifically scientific. It was an impact that these men uh, had on each other, okay? They had intellect, conscience, enthusiasm, wit and humor and they left a mark on each other and on individuals and collective efforts which impacted scientific institutions which they created and nurtured. So here's a picture of a young Goku at uh, winning a wrestling match in college. This gentleman went on to study neutrinos with Cecil Powell, uh, the Nobel laureate, and then came back to India to the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. And because of a tragic mishap in 1964, when Homi Baba, the visionary and charismatic leader, was killed in an air crash, Goku was suddenly catapulted at the age of 37 onto the stage of the directorship of TIFR. It was not something he wanted. He had to think hard about taking it on, but he did it. Here's a picture of him with Mrs. G several years later. Goku, of course, is MGK Menon, who started so many efforts in this country. Shashi talked yesterday about the Department of Electronics and the impact of IT. How did that come about? Goku was a neutrino physicist. He was trying to figure out how neutrinos uh, actually what their energy is and where, you know, to even detect them. We didn't have any electronics in India in the 50s. He had to build his own instruments, right? And he did that and that, that effort grew into something which became the Department of Electronics. He's also headed the Department of Space briefly after Vikram Sarabhai passed away suddenly. He headed the Department of Science and Technology. He was an advisor to the Prime Minister. He was an MP. He was uh, an academician of the Pontifical Academy of the Vatican, so a polymath, right? And the next is perhaps not as familiar to this audience, a guy called Shivraj. Shivraj doing experimental physics in the 40s in IISC, a student of Sir Raman's. Many years later, talking about the capacity for building new materials, designing things all the way from cardiac stents to rocket parts because of his deep interest in crystallography. He worked with Dorothy Hodgkin at Oxford uh, and built all kinds of new materials. Became the president of the Indian Academy of Science, single-handedly almost pushed scientific publishing in India to, to ensure that there was Indian journals that would take papers about science that was done in India. So um, his name is Sivaraj Ramaseshan. Um, Satish, here a young assistant professor in 1951. Satish was at Caltech when India went through the whole uh, tragedy of partition. He grew up in Lahore. The India he came back to had no resemblance to the India he left. Uh, he was an aeronautical engineer. Here's India's first supersonic tunnel. It, it was about yay big, okay? You start from these small beginnings and you end up with something like the space program. And here's a picture of him much later in life. The most maverick of all of these four friends was a guy called Rad. In 1964, actually Rad had left India in the 50s shaking the dust of India from his feet, saying, I want to be in a place which is open and free. I want to sail boats. I want to be able to build aeroplanes. I want to do things very differently. I don't see a scientific career uh, in a stodgy fashion that was the model back then. 
So he, he took off, uh, went to all kinds of different places, traveled the world in search of adventure, built a trimaran and sailed it from Ipswich to Sydney with two other people. Okay, that's a picture of the Cygnus back in 1964. In 1971, Sir Raman passed away and there was a vacuum. Who's going to do this? Who's going to direct this incredible institute, the legacy of Sir C. V. Raman? And Radhakrishnan, of course, was Raman's son and he wanted nothing to do with this. But he was persuaded by three people, Satish, Goku and Sivaraj. They said, you have to do this. This is really important. You need to create a new institutional model. It's not going to be seen as a dynastic rule. You need to do things differently and you need to create this new institution. He did come back. He built a new institutional model. It moved away from just uh, the kind of physics that Sir Raman did. They did astrophysics. They did liquid crystal physics, solid state physics, even moved into biology. Okay, so a totally new and this was the last thing on Rad's mind as a young man. Okay. So each of these people had been led by circumstances beyond their own making. They stepped into a void, knowing it was not what they would really like to do, given a choice, but then realizing that when asked, they couldn't refuse to move laterally from their area of scientific uh, interest to steering institutes. So what I want to say is that right now you guys are mostly on the threshold of a new career, right? And there's a lot of aspiration and a lot of anxiety. But I think that there's also a larger purpose which may not be clear to you right now. And there often isn't in the rough and tumble of doing science and getting grants and mentoring students and keeping family happy and getting everything else done that you need to do. It's not clear to you what your purpose is. But the question is, will you recognize it when it happens? I want to tell you a more contemporary story, which also inspires me. And this is the so story of Sanjeev Khosla. Okay, so Sanjeev uh, did his PhD at the ISC, studying uh, epigenetics and mealybugs, then went off to Azim Surani's lab, uh, where he studied germ cells, and came back to Hyderabad, to the Center for DNA Fingerprinting and Diagnostics, wanting to do mouse genetics and epigenetics for a variety of reasons, and none of these are the failure of the institute, but because of a m multiple different circumstances that happened, there were no mouse facilities and it was impossible for him to actually get his program off the ground. So it was difficult, very difficult for somebody whose keen interest was in studying germ cell specification and epigenetics to actually uh, uh, deal with this situation. His solution was to move laterally and study host pathogen interactions in MTB and macrophages. And he actually had some phenomenal findings in the last few years where he actually shows that the methylation of the host genome during infection, there's an interaction of proteins of, my, of mycobacteria with host chromatin and his uh, interest in uh, epigenetics and chromatin modifiers came very much to the fore in this study. And so what I see it as is turning adversity into great science with great impact because what he was studying earlier was really a fundamental problem with no obvious applications. So what I want to say is that he never would have thought of studying infectious diseases, but he ended up doing something which potentially could have tremendous <coughs> impact. Okay. So, so I want to give you some gyan because that's what I'm supposed to do and for our non-Indian friends, gyan is supposed to be true knowledge but of course in Bollywood it's always said sarcastically. So I want to tell you how important it is to have mentors and to take seriously what your mentors are uh, 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 showing you by example really, not necessarily everything they say. I want to say how, what a privilege it is to do science, okay, it's not a job, it's something that you just live and you wake up in the middle of the night solving puzzles. How great is that? Take your science seriously and take yourself fairly lightly because I think uh, if you worry too much about climbing the ladder and winning the awards, you're actually not going to enjoy yourself too much. Let both success and failure sit softly on your shoulders. See the success in failure and count your blessings. Love what you do even when you hate it. 
and impact your environment by participating with enthusiasm. The other really important thing is reverse mentoring and learning from your students. I've learned so much from the people who've come through my lab over the years. So I'll stop there and thank you all for this platform.